Thank you for very interesting interventions. I feel it's a little bit Titanic-like, our present situation, though, and I don't think the conference or the intervention sufficiently recognize this. That is to say, we recognize the progress that's been made, the SDGs, the reduced poverty, but we're living in a time with a disintegration of the international trading system, tremendous deaths in conflict and huge refugee movements, reversal of democracy and human rights in many parts of the world, mass migration and climate change, all which would threaten not just people but also even the planet. And the only real threat we've been talking about is robots, and, and of course I agree with that threat too. But I wonder what the panel feels, what WIDER should do in the light of this much more depressing scenario than we've really been uh, recognizing. Thank you very much. This, so this was a question to all of you. Uh, you'll keep it in mind and, and, and you'll get back to it. Uh, here, we, here we have one in front. We'll take a few questions and please identify yourselves as well as to whom you are addressing the question, please. Thank you, Rolf van der Hoeven of the Institute of Social Studies. I also address my question to all members of the parliament because I want to raise the issue which Rafi mentioned in the end, that's the issue of redistribution. Benno spoke about it and spoke about it. And David Malone also indirectly, because he spoke about the Sustainable Development Goals. And as you know, there is a number 10 goal, which is uh, reducing inequality. But if you see the history of the goal, it was a very checkered history. Uh, the original formulation to have um, a specific measure for inequality was refused. And at the end, we got actually a very weak uh, compromise uh, that the poor uh, segment of the population should grow faster than the medium. That is not really redistribution, and that was the outcome of a compromise. Now here comes my question. Uh, the proposals made by Benno and Anne of uh, taxing capital, because that's what you actually want to do when you want to uh, redistribute from the R, uh, needs international coordination. If one country is taxing capital and the other not, you cannot do it. So my question is, on the one hand, we had this uh, SDG dynamic, which not really countries could not compromise yet on uh, redistributive measures. There very was a weak compromise. And on the other hand, uh, one of the outcomes of this conference is that we really should do it. So one of the maybe tasks for wider is also how can you create an, a more uh, congenious atmosphere for international compromises and international agreements on redistribution? Thank you very, very much. Big questions to, to our panelists to answer. I think that there was a lady here in front, and then we can take a gentleman there in the middle, and then I'll give it to the panel to answer. Thank you very much, Stephanie Griffiths-Jones. Um, I, I wanted to address my question to Ben Ondulu. Uh, he explained brilliantly the, the predicament that African countries today face, um, but it's a sort of tremendous... Uh, a feeling of deja vu, because we have all been there before in the emerging economies, in the poor countries, and even in the rich countries. So my question is a sort of coming out, a bit out of frustration. What can we do? Is it political economy? Is it technical discussions? So that the mistakes are not exactly repeated, though in different forms, um, uh, and... Uh, because in other fields of knowledge and science, uh, people tend to learn. But in finance, we never seem to learn. Thank you very much. And there in the middle. Thank you. I, Rob Davies from Zimbabwe. Uh, the question I have affects everyone in the, in, on the panel, but mainly directed to Ravi. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, the, the, the question of robots and distribution of income. There have been suggestions about taxing capital from your co-panelists and some discussion during the conference. Uh, I was slightly disappointed that the first time Carla Mona was mentioned and uh, the work or the ideas of universal basic share rather than basic income uh, was, was with uh, Joe Stiglitz's presentation this morning. Given that he's one of your fellow uh, signatories of the Stockholm Statement, 
And they, they, I think I did a quick count. The nine of the 13 signatories have been at this conference. I just wonder what you think about the idea of universal basic share as a way of tackling that, that problem rather than universal basic income. Thank you very much. It looks like that I need to give uh, a word to all the panelists in the first round, but I'll start with Benno because there was a specific question addressed to you. I think the, the challenge on uh, debt management uh, along the lines that uh, I tried to uh, put forward um, may have to be addressed, I think, from uh, two points of vantage. One, I, it's always a starting point on getting things right. Uh, and we shouldn't be waiting for doing debt sustainability analysis, which are done at points in time, you get a seal of approval. Uh, but we should continuously have a debt dynamics uh, sort of assessment which we can do on our own, just to make sure that when you are borrowing, you are borrowing with sustainability sort of uh, conditions being very, very, uh, 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 very clear. But this is only for new, <laughs> new debt. But I'm sure you were asking also, what do you do to fix what uh, um, uh, we have had so far? I, I think in one of the sessions, there was a conversation about looking also at the private sector balance sheets uh, in relation to regulating uh, uh, also their own profile of debt. Uh, and one aspect should be currency mismatch. Uh, and this is something that can be done uh, by regulators. Um, uh, but uh, my advice to a couple of countries that I see uh, actually now coming definitely into a major crisis. Uh, and fortunately, one of them, I think, is already doing that. Uh, we borrowed fairly short. Um, and we can make negotiations either for restructuring so that uh, we do lengthen the maturity uh, and give ourselves enough time, uh, A, for those projects to start generating revenues, and B, uh, to get and make sure that uh, uh, impact on exports uh, is actually also uh, forthcoming, because that will resolve your foreign currency uh, 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 constraint. But apart from restructuring, I think uh, uh, restructuring can also be done maybe instead of waiting for another hippie, this would be a good time uh, for some of either IDA or IBRD type uh, loans, which would be taken not to fund new investment, rather than to buy back uh, this type of uh, uh, debt, which is shorter term and mature, this is one way of restructuring and giving oneself also relief. Uh, this problem I'm talking about is real, and I think there are more than 10, 15 countries that are likely to get into real big trouble in not, in not more than two, three years mm -hmm. uh, from now. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's really an issue that needs to be dealt with. Just to follow up on Benno's point, I think uh, uh, to have instruments of that type, uh, in, in, uh, from, uh, those instruments sort of exist for natural disasters, right? The, the sort of the, the, de the deferred drawdown option of, uh, of the World Bank, uh, which was an IBRD instrument, but then uh, we pushed for it to be IDA as well. So, you know, uh, all the preconditions and all the work is done before the hurricane strikes, so to speak, okay? You don't run around after it strikes to say, oh, we've got to now find the money for it and so on. And it strikes me that it, it's, it's amazing how often this refinancing issue uh, appears suddenly on, on, on the horizon 
uh, and then we don't, know, we don't know what to do with it. So I think a, a DDO type operation might be something which could be, uh, which could be uh, relevant, relevant for that, where the sum is approved and you specify a number of reasons for which it could be drawn, drawn down, and one of them could well be this drawdown thing. So anyway, that's a suggestion that, that, that I and others were working on. So uh, uh, actually, I agree with all the points that uh, were made. So I have not, no sort of disagreement, uh, really. Um, on, on the universal basic share, universal basic income, and so on, I think in the, in the panel on poverty and inequality, I did say that that, that, that whole class of things should be, could be a major topic for WIDA to be, to be working on. Because we already saw, actually, just focusing just on the UBI, forget about the, U, the UBS, uh, the UBI, the tremendous disagreements uh, are even on the purely economic technical side of things, uh, but then also in terms of this work, whether work requirement is a, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and people have very strong positions on both sides. And I think that WIDA could be a place where that is, where that is, that is done, and I think that could be both deliverable and fundable, is the, uh, uh, wearing, wearing those two other things. Uh, and of course, I, I mean, I agree with Francis. I, I, I don't want to disagree. Maybe I was too busy re rearranging the deck chairs, Francis, to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to notice the point. But again, I, I think I, I highlighted the labor-saving technical change. I think, I think to say it's, it's ro the robots are coming is too... Uh, actually, it's happening everywhere. It's happening in agriculture. It's happening in, uh, uh, everywhere. And I think that's, that's a set of issues, okay? Uh, some years ago, we were with, uh, with Kamla Bain in, in, uh, in Gujarat, and we were picking... Uh, in, the, in the tobacco fields, and there's a particular time of the year when you have to uh, pick a growth off the tobacco plant, because then it grows bushily. It's got Pilu Cardna is the, is, the, is the local sort of name. And the big concern for Kamla Bain was that a new form of chemical had come, which you just spray it, and the thing falls off by itself. Okay? In other words, she would not have the work. And this was, this was, this was uh, 10 years ago. Okay. So it's coming in agriculture, and it's not, ro it's not just robots, it's just, it's just this push that's coming. And, and I do believe that's, that's of titanic proportions. So, uh, but anyway, thank you. On inequality, I'm glad you pointed to the weakness of that goal because it illustrates the sort of fudge you get when 193 countries are negotiating with each other, each one having a blocking vote. So you tend to get a uh, fairly modest ambition. That being said, some of the other goals are better defined and more ambitious. But thank you for flagging that. Uh, Francis, I agree with you uh, very strongly on, on one of the issues that you mentioned. On a couple of others, I, I think uh, we may be in a temporarily worse situation than we necessarily will be in 10 years. The one I'm really worried about is climate change. Why? Because we all know what needs to be done now. The science is very conclusive. Uh, you have to be very determined to ignore evidence to uh, believe that um, uh, urgent action isn't necessary today by um, the large industrial states, at least, and most others in solidarity with them. Uh, and the truth is, since everybody enjoyed the Paris Conference and signing on to the Paris Accord so much, nothing much has happened in the negotiations in the UN to follow up on implementation. It's been painfully slow. Uh, in progress. And so I think we have a really big problem there staring us in the face, and I'm very grateful to you for mentioning it. Also, conflict and migration there, um, I think partly because Europe is at the center of uh, a wave of migration resulting from conflict in part. Uh, there is a sense that the continent's being overwhelmed by these factors. Uh, sitting a bit further away in Japan or, or uh, Canada, say, I'm uh, being a Canadian, uh, um, first of all, historically, Europe has coped with migration much greater than the current waves of migration in the past. So there's a very strong element of political uh, packaging, manipulation, and so on this time around. Uh, 
secondly, um, I think many of the migrants from, say, Syria and Afghanistan were their countries to become a little bit more promising might well want to return. Indeed, given the rather inhospitable welcome of much of Europe, many of them are beginning to return. It's actually a rather sad reflection, it seems to me, on the values we pretend to hold. Um, on conflict, unfortunately, Western powers seem drawn to the Middle East like a flame, and I include that uh, like moths to a flame. I include Afghanistan in the Middle East, although you can also, of course, include it in South Asia. It's the bridge between the two with Pakistan. Um, uh, and so if you think about it, Al-Qaeda incubated in Afghanistan, uh, ISIS incubated in Iraq. Those are not coincidences. We have something to do with that when I say we, not necessarily we in this room, but the countries of many of those of us in this room. Uh, and our politicians seem remarkably impervious to learning any lessons uh, from uh, these uh, misadventures, which the costs of which are being borne by the local inhabitants, very largely, many of them today refugees and quasi-refugees. The strand of migrants from Africa, I think, is in a different category. And there, I think everything we heard from you, Benno, is really, really relevant because uh, there is going to be a lot more migration out of Africa unless uh, employment-creating growth in Africa takes hold more firmly and, and the debt burden you mentioned, I think, is very relevant, takes uh, hold more firmly than it has so far. So I do separate the conflict-affected migration from the more economic migration. I sympathize with both, but the causes are rather different. And I'm very grateful to you for raising these issues. I'm also very grateful to you for raising the issue of climate change. I mean, I personally think that that is the single most important issue facing the planet. Today, um, as a researcher, I have shifted much of my energy towards exploring these areas, and in particular, the intersection of emerging market challenges and environmental challenges is one that researchers have done less on. There's been a lot of work in the developed world on the effects of an environment, much less in, in emerging markets. And, and it's a very challenging. So for example, I just, I've been working on a paper for years now, looking at the effects of India's Supreme Court action plans on firm behavior in India. The Supreme Court of India has passed law after law after law, as have the states. And from what I can tell from my research, it has had no impact or very little impact except on the largest firms on their behavior in terms of pollution abatement or reduction in the use of, of coal, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a really important issue as, as the next dean of Berkeley's business school, probably the first thing I will do is try to find a way for all those students, most of whom end up in Silicon Valley, to shift their focus towards issues of water, which California is facing, issues of wildfires, issues of natural disasters, which, which is really affecting not just California, but the world. Having said all that, however, I'm not sure that wider should be addressing these issues given its limited, um, its limited capacity and, and funding because this is an issue which is being addressed, perhaps not adequately and certainly politically. It's a disaster all over the world. There's an entire group at the World Bank, both within research and outside of research, devoted to the environment and climate change, the OECD has a group. I mean, so many people are working on that. 
In contrast, there are other issues that are perhaps less important, but which a lot of uh, global think tanks are not so much looking at and where I think wider is more open-minded. Um, so let me just mention two of them, if I may. Um, one issue that has received very mixed ex reviews in the last three days is this issue of regionalism. With the advent of right-wing political parties and, uh, and the change in the political climate, global trade, the growth of global trade has, has stopped. If you look at the data, um, aggregate global trade is, is, is stalled. The growth in global trade as a share of GDP has stalled. And many countries and regions are turning to regionalism as a solution. I think this deserves some further thought. Um, John Page is sitting in the middle of the room. He was my first employer when I got to the World Bank. And the first thing John asked me to do in 19, you probably don't even remember this, John. The first thing John made me do as a young professional was get on a plane during hurricane season and go to every member of the CARICOM community which is the regional integration community in the Caribbean. So off I went to Trinidad and St. Lucia and Jamaica and Guyana. And it would have been fun if it wasn't September, October, right? Um, and one of the things one quickly discovers working on CARICOM is that it has some benefits, but it also had some very significant costs for the members of the community because typically the common external tariff that was being chosen was not the lowest among the members, it was typically the highest, right? And so I, I really think that a lot more, given that the world community is moving increasingly towards regionalism, um, I think that that's something that really deserves some careful thought in order to promote trade creation, not trade diversion. I think there are a lot of other things that could be addressed. How to design preferences in, in industrial countries to maximize the gains for emerging markets. The fact that the least developed countries in the world only account for 1% of global trade, and yet they are on track to account for at least 15% of global population in, in a short period. Um, the, these, are, these are really important issues. The fact that the agenda in the global trade discussion has moved to what's called trade facilitation, yet there are very few researchers whom we respect who have actually worked on the topic of trade facilitation. So that's a whole issue. Um, I, I should say that the issue that Ravi brought up is also near and dear to my heart. So. Gary Fields and I were talking about this earlier today. I was in a very um, prominent conversation at CUNY. Uh, is Janet Gornick here? Is she still here or she may have left? I was in a conversation with Paul Krugman, David Otter, Brad DeLong, myself, and um, Eduardo Porter, um, Eduardo Porter of the New York Times earlier, and I brought up this very idea from Atkinson's book and, and paper. I brought up some of his ideas, of which one of the most interesting to me is the concept that technological change is endogenous, and we could affect the path of technology by promoting labor using instead of labor saving technological change. And by the way, this is an idea that has, was also picked up um, by Bill Gates uh, of Microsoft, the same idea. So I brought up this idea, and I have never received such negative reactions on the part of my fellow panelists. David Otter just kind of <laughs> fell out of his seat and said, what are you talking about? Are you against technology? So I think it's that kind of response that suggests to me that this is not necessarily going to be picked up by the mainstream, whereas the issue of environmental challenges are being picked up. So I would, I would encourage um, wider to, to address um, those kinds of issues. Thank you, Anne. Now, 
I would give a floor to one question that would be addressed to each of the panelists so that they can wrap up, each of them in one minute, their key message. Thank you so much. Uh, I highly appreciate it. I'm Tad Dessa from Ethiopia. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, UN Wider uh, for uh, such uh, a broad gathering and uh, where we had knowledge sharing and as well as uh, so delicious food, uh, what we had. So thank you so much. It's a great opportunity for some of, uh, I mean, uh, maybe high profile scientists may have large opportunity, but those of uh, in the medium level may not have such opportunity. So thank you so much. That is uh, the, uh, the, the first one. The second one, issue of uh, uh, data usage. I hope I heard in the first day, UN, uh, UIDER has gathered large amount of data which, which is available in the stock. So I don't know exactly that is open for access because data is only productive when it's used by different large number of researchers. So maybe that is a question. The third one, which I haven't seen adequately addressed, is the issue of uh, use and employment. Uh, um, in most cases in Africa, in many developing countries, one of burning development issue is uh, use unemployment. Uh, and it's like uh, leading a fire in the dry grass because nowadays uh, most of political issues and arrests are mainly emanate from those uh, use unemployment related issues. So maybe I don't know in the future whether uh, UN wider could take these issues as critical because it has valuable, valuable development implication for uh, future development. So these are a few comments I have. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Now, I don't think that the panel is responsible for the good food. So this one is something you are not uh, responding. I think that that goes to, to, to the wider team and the caterer. Data and youth. These two issues may be... Um... Uh, and let, me, let me just say that at least my understanding is that the data that WIDA has is, is publicly available, uh, easily downloadable, and so on. So just send an email to, to Finn, uh, and then after that to Kunal. And, uh, and I think that that's really is one of the major contributions that WIDA makes uh, to capacity building and knowledge, uh, the, uh, the free access of, of data. All the papers that are published by WIDA and so on are all available free access to, to be downloaded. On the youth uh, uh, issue, again, um, uh, the reason why I like the labor, the, the labor saving technical change type uh, issue is because so many things can be brought under it in a, in a, in a systematic way. Uh, so there's one type of uh, displacement, uh, which is the 40-year-old steel worker <laughs> or the 40-year-old car worker in South Africa whose job has been uh, taken away. The notion that you're going to make that 40-year-old <laughs> steel worker a computer programmer by uh, uh, retraining and so on is, is fanciful. And this person is going to be with us for the next 40 years, okay? So that, that set of issues, I think, uh, is an important one. But then the youth issue is, of course, that since on the demographic end we have a youth coming up, it's, a sa it's the same issue it, in, in some sense. If those jobs are not there, uh, wh how are we going to find uh, uh, employed that youth? So I think that, that, that frames things, uh, in my view anyway, quite, quite well, without going into the detail uh, of, the, of the issue, which I think is very important. Uh, thank you, uh, David, please. Um, on youth unemployment, I don't have an economist's answer for you, but I happen to live in Japan where there's a curious phenomenon of virtually full employment, if you look at the statistics. In fact, most countries would find the statistics very enviable. Uh, but at the same time, quite a large number of young people, in, including large numbers of young men, who are very disaffected by the job opportunities available. They basically aren't interested in the jobs available for them. Uh, they either feel they can't access or they can't access the high quality jobs, uh, and they aren't willing to settle indefinitely for uh, glorified internships and traineeships and so on. 
And this is the, the, the generation of young people, some of whom have become so-called shut-ins in their parents' homes. Now, I think what this reveals is there's a way, uh, in a sense, in a number of societies, a mismatch between uh, how individuals are educated, the types of jobs that are available, the sorts of policies governments want to adopt to pretend there isn't a problem, so endless traineeships and, and uh, uh, internships and so on get underwritten. But actually, I think in the industrialized world, there is a growing mismatch uh, between high quality jobs available and uh, young people graduating from high school, from college, from uh, university and so on. Uh, and so this is uh, an issue that requires real attention in the industrialized world. For I think reasons Benno was alluding to and we've heard a lot about in the conference, uh, in Africa it's a huge issue of you know where employment is going to be created for the very large numbers of young people that are anticipated to be joining the current African uh, population. And uh, in Latin America also, it's both a, a supply of jobs and a quality of jobs for younger people with higher aspirations that one senses often uh, fuels uh, tension in some of the Latin American countries. Thank you very much for the question. An amateur's answer. Thank you, Anne. Yes, I just want to echo the other panelists' uh, uh, point that, that the issue of, of youth unemployment is a really important one. Um, I, I personally don't have much to say on that, except in the context of globalization, uh, what we're seeing and is and is that basically people have a very hard time, even within countries, moving to where the jobs are. And so, for example, one sees that in a country like Brazil, people are left unemployed by the trade reforms for years, even though if they were able to move, that wouldn't happen. Michigan has never quite recovered from globalization in the United States. So, so we're seeing within, not just across countries it's difficult to move, but within countries. And I think this issue of, of people being able to move or being provided with support to move is something that needs, needs to be addressed. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, maybe just to echo um, exactly what uh, others have said. Uh, you know, amazingly, I was looking at the data and I thought maybe the majority of the youth in the world are from Africa, and it is not the case. Uh, it is actually from Asia, and we only overtake, we only overtake Asia in 2080. In 2050, we'll almost be at par, yeah, almost be at par. And the supply of youth for the rest of the world actually will be from those two mm. regions. Mm. So if we don't fix that problem, you have to fix the migration problem. Mm. You, you can't have it both ways. Mm. And I think it's not just the issue of retraining them and making sure that they have the capabilities. Fortunately, in the work that uh, uh, we are doing for a commission, it's called Pathways uh, for Prosperity Commission on uh, Technology and Inclusive Development, and we are issuing our first two reports next month, on October 4th, it's uh, hosted in Oxford. We actually look at platforms for matching skills and jobs, uh, platforms that actually address, these are digital platforms that address and reduce search costs. Um, part of the mismatch is really an issue of flow of information. It's not all just because the skills are not relevant. 
Uh, and in some of these countries, that aspect alone could solve probably about 20 to 30% of the, the problem. And then the rest would be structural in terms of uh, the mismatch in terms of the actual skills. So uh, I think it is a problem worth really paying attention to, but it, it should be done in the context that uh, Ravi actually uh, already uh, raised. Uh, thank you very much, Benno, and I, I can see that I am not keeping my part of the deal to, to Finn, and we are a little bit running out of time. Uh, so, very much thank you for the panelists, and I would like all of you to join for a round of applause.